So recently we've had some pretty serious examples of Buddhist political violence in, in the news, and particularly in, in Burma and, and around Burma with the Rohingya. So what I want to discuss today is the issue of Buddhist fundamentalism. What is it and what should we think about it coming up? So I'm Doug Smith. I'm study director at the Secular Buddhist Association. That's secularbuddhism.org. And if you're interested in helping to try to promote a wiser and a kinder and a less stress-filled world, consider subscribing to the channel. We'll have talks like this out roughly once or twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays if I can manage it. And we'll be discussing issues of early Buddhism, secular Buddhism, secularism, and related topics such as this one today about Buddhist fundamentalism. So some of you may be familiar with the issue of the Rohingya in Burma, a Muslim subculture that has been uh, persecuted within that country for many years and that now is being expelled to a larger degree. Uh, there's been violence put against them. Some people believe it may be even be a, an example of ethnic cleansing by the Burmese government. I wrote about this situation a few years ago in, the blo in my blog over at secularbuddhism.org and my friend Justin Whitaker has been writing about it more recently and I'll try to link uh, some of those articles down below in the notes. So what do you mean by the word fundamentalism? If we're going to look at the, what Buddhist fundamentalism might be, what it might, what it might mean. And I think there are two issues, there are two related but different uh, notions of fundamentalism that we're working with in the West. The first is a kind of religious notion that allies itself with political conservatism. That is, it tends to be ethnic, it tends to be nationalist, it tends to be uh, sexist in many ways, and it tends to be allied to the military, it tends to be militarist. And the second notion of, uh, of fundamentalism, religious fundamentalism, is, is an idea uh, where your, religi your religious ideas come from the fundamentals of scripture. That is, it's a scriptural literalism. Now there are elements of the first sort of fundamentalism, this fundamentalism that allies with political conservatism, we can see in contemporary Burma. This, no, this, this idea of the nine, six, what's called the 969 movement, a group of, of monastics who are very ethnic, very nationalist, who are very uh, anti people who are uh, Muslim. That leads to the, the, the persecution of this Rohingya uh, subculture, subclass of, of, of citizens within the country. We can also see elements of this kind of fundamentalism in uh, the problems that uh, Theravada monk, uh, nuns have had in uh, legitimizing themselves in contemporary Southeast Asia. Some of you may know that uh, Theravada nun, the nun's order, uh, was extinguished uh, many centuries ago and there's been ever since a question of whether indeed it can be restarted. I won't get into all the specifics but it's a complex situation. The idea is that in the Vinaya, in the, in the, in the Buddhist law, the new order, a new order of, of nuns can only be started by an old order of nuns and since there aren't any Theravada nuns around it seems like that can't be done. People get around that by looking to uh, nuns from other traditions, in particular the Mahayana. And the question is, is that legitimate or not? But whether it's legitimate or not, this, this fits in with the first sort of fundamentalism I was talking about before. That is a certain kind of political conservatism, which tends to be allied to, to notions of sexism. Women are sort of second-class citizens within culture and as well within the Sangha. Now in the West, these two kinds of fundamentalism tend to be, tend to go together. That is to say, scriptural literalism tends to go with the political conservatism. The scripture tends to, uh, I'm not going to say in all cases because it certainly doesn't, but in a, to, a, to an extent tends to uh, back up certain kinds of politi conservative political ideas. However, this is much less the case in Buddhism and early Buddhism, which is why I wanted to, to raise this today. Because we find that many of the top scholars, actually, of early Buddhism in the West say that uh, scriptural literalism, even if, you, if you're going to be a scriptural literalist, you do not have, you do not find support for the idea that there cannot be a nun's order uh, in Theravada Buddhism. Many of the top scholars uh, in the West uh, believe this, including uh, Ajahn Bramali, uh, Sujato, um, uh, Richard Gombrich, and one of the top uh, scholars uh, presently, uh, Analio. There is disagreement from uh, monk uh, Tanisaro Bhikkhu, 
but I think he's in the minority, at least uh, among scholars in the West. But more importantly, when it comes to issues of political violence, of nationalism, of, of ethnic cleansing that we see now uh, in Burma, we find uh, no support at all for that kind of position within the early texts. And this is, I think, of really great importance to issues of, of fundamentalism within Buddhism. Because if one is going to be a scriptural fundamentalist in Buddhism, one is going to be a, a pacifist. One is not going to believe that, that one is greater than someone else because of one's ethnicity or one's uh, national origin. One of the great in philosophical inventions of the Buddha during his age was that he turned the notion, the, the Brahminic notion of value on its head. For the Brahmins, the idea of human value, of personal nobility, came from one's past, from one's background, from one's parents. So that what made one a noble, what made one a Brahmin, was that one had a certain kind of ethnic background, if you like, or a certain kind of social background from one's parents, one's grandparents, and so on. The Buddha, however, turned that over. What he said was, yes, there is a sense of, of value within uh, human society, but what makes somebody a Brahmin, what makes someone uh, a noble, is not their ethnic background, is not their parents and their grandparents, it's their ethical conduct. And a key part of that ethical conduct is pacifism, frankly. The Buddha has a very, very famous uh, passage where he recommends that even if you are being literally tortured by, by uh, bandits out to, to steal all of your money, you should nevertheless not look at them with a mind of hatred. And for the Buddha, one who was awakened would be incapable uh, of killing people. So th the notion that uh, monastics within a Theravada country uh, that are supposedly believers in scriptural literalism to an extent, anyhow, uh, would perpetrate this stuff, it's completely against the message in their own scriptures. To be fair, uh, there are many people in the West who say the same thing about Christianity, that, that, uh, that Jesus was a pacifist and that therefore Christians who support warfare in Jesus' name are also contradicting themselves. And I'm not enough of a scholar uh, in early Christianity to, to know whether that's correct. However, we do know that to an extent, Jesus was, uh, Jesus was a Jew. He was a believer in the, what we call the Old Testament or the Jewish Bible. And in the Jewish Bible, there certainly are many, many, many examples of ethnic cleansing, of large massacres that were done in God's name. Uh, within uh, the Pali Canon, we, see, we find absolutely nothing comparable to this. There's no uh, examples in the Canon of, of, of any killings of, of humans that are lauded in any way. This, however, does not stop um, contemporary and, and past Buddhists from interpreting the canon in a way that, that seems to allow them to promote violence. And I would submit that these are ways that fundamentalism goes against the kind of kindness that we expect from, from Buddhism. It goes against uh, the wisdom that we find in Buddhism. And it certainly goes against the, the reduction in stress that we find from any kind of a wise teaching. Because fundamentalism at its base involves a clinging to views, involves a, an identification with both viewpoints and with one's own caste and clan and ethnicity and country and sex and whatever it might be, as against those outsiders to whom one is in opposition. So the upshot of this is that early Buddhism, the Buddhism of the Pali Canon, is anti-fundamentalist in the first sense. And to the extent that we're going to be literalists about the early canon, we're not going to be able to support the kinds of conservative views that we find some within contemporary Southeast Asia promoting. So I hope this discussion has been useful to you to try to tease out the differences between uh, Western fundamentalism, where we get the word really, and Buddhist ideas of fundamentalism or the way that we might uh, misconstrue what fundamentalism means within a Buddhist context. If you're new to the channel, I'm really glad to have you here. I hope you'll check out some of the other videos, talk about a lot of topics uh, within Buddhism and early Buddhism and secularism and so on. And if you're back for more, glad to have you back. Thanks a lot. Catch you on the next one.